I now look to Lord Adonis to close the case for the opposition. Mr President, um, uh, I sh can, can, may I begin with a, a confession? Uh, you originally invited me to uh, propose the motion, but there was an imbalance of speakers, so I agreed to oppose the motion. Now, being a, being, being a good debater, one can fashion one's arguments to either, either side of, uh, of a proposition as nebulous as, as this one, so there's no, th there was no problem in doing that. And indeed, I have some form, because when I was a student at this uh, great university, I didn't, in fact, ever address uh, the Oxford Union. I did try to address the Oxford Union once. I came to my freshers' debate, and the president was a character called William Hague. Uh, but he overlooked my manifest talents. Uh, he didn't call me, and I never, I never came into the Oxford Union again. And I've, I've addressed the Oxford Union far, far more frequently in the last three or four years since I've become a populist campaigner for Britain staying in the European Union, a people's vote, and ending Brexit than I ever was before. However, the other reason. The other reason, Mr President, why I didn't uh, engage in the Oxford Union is I very quickly got engaged in local politics in Oxford. And if I may say so, the brilliant speech ba made by the member w uh, who brought to us her experience uh, in Cowley uh, re resonates with me. It was experiences similar to that that got me very involved in local politics. And I stood twice uh, to be a member of Oxford City Council. The first time I lost by 20 votes in the student ward, which was then called Central. My big campaigning slogan was to defend the kebab vans. Are there still kebab vans in the centre of Oxford? There was then a kebab van outside Oriel, which I believe is the presidential uh, college, uh, and uh, the, uh, there was a move to remove it. There were local residents who were against. I fought tooth and nail to defend the kebab van. I became known as Kebab. That was my slogan in the... Uh, I was, I, there was nobody more populist in Oxford politics than me. <laughs> but, alas, the electorate thought differently and I lost. So I had then to seek election the following year, what was much better territory of what would now be known as, as uh, the independent group. It was then called the SDP. Uh, and I, I fled to North Oxford, which was thought to be more fertile territory. Now, the great burghers of North Oxford, who then included a lot of dons who lived in very expensive houses, the dons can no longer afford to live in those houses in North Oxford, they were all owned by all of the merchant bankers and the hedge fund people and all that. But the dons then, they did not like the kebab vans at all. So I had to pivot. I, I said that we should set up an inquiry into the kebab vans. I saw all kinds of environmental problems with them. I thought maybe there should be closing hours for the kebab vans. And then I hit upon the ultimate wheeze, which is that the kebab vans should be moved. I didn't say where they should be moved. I said they should be somewhere accessible, safe and available to be open all hours. That was my slogan, which I had then. Uh, I won that election by a landslide. <laughs> so uh, the, the arguments for and against uh, uh, kebabs are, are eminently flexible. The truth of the matter, M Mr President, is that in electoral politics and popular politics, you do need, and I do agree, you do need to be popular to win. But you need to be popular and right, not popular and wrong. You need to be popular and moral, not popular and immoral. You need to be popular and tell the truth and be, not be popular and tell lies. It's not difficult, it's what my colleague here who I think is, would make an excellent president of the Oxford Union, but then the other one would make an excellent president too, or sport for choice. It is, it is, it is what my friend, it is, it is what my friend from Exeter called good against evil. It is the ultimate battle which we've always seen uh, throughout the ages. Now, I notice, I, I notice, Mr. President, that there is much populism in the Oxford Union itself. The sl the, these slates, which I understand have not been, um, have not been banned after all. <laughs> I, have been, I, have been, I have been on the web, Mr President, and I have observed the slates. And uh, there is nothing more populist than the programmes on which people stand to be President of the Oxford Union. <laughs> It appears to be there is almost no expense that can't be spared. There are no drinks that cannot be bought. There are no arrangements for the bar that cannot be uh, arranged. And everyone seems like ev everyone seems to be engaged in the in the ultimate business of politics, which is trying to give everyone something for nothing. Everyone I see stands on cutting membership fees. Sometimes it's an aspiration. Sometimes it's an immediate objective. Uh, all of the parties and the states, of course, have meaningless uh, uh, l labels. I see it was last time, was it progress against, against refresh? 
Was that it? For progress. Well, I'm both in, can I, can I let you into a secret? I'm both in favour of progress and refreshment. I think they're both great. <laughs> now, the two slogans I see we have this time are together v engaged. Is that correct? Well, do you know, I want to be together and engaged. <laughs> I invite you to, what we need, we have had, Mr. President, we have had too much division in the Oxford Union. What we need to do is to disband these parties and we need to unite as independents in favour of togetherness and engagement. And then the Oxford Union will go from strength to strength. So uh, the only way you can avoid being popular in politics is the ultimate form of uh, elitism, which is to be a member of the House of Lords. <laughs> The ultimate institution which doesn't re I, uh, requires to be elected by one person. I am a, I am a member of Parliament by, by virtue of nomination by one person, Tony Blair. I was extremely popular with Tony Blair. <laughs> I'm not aware that I was popular with anyone else. But that's enough to give me a life seat in the House of Lords. And eminent social science research shows that it extends your life expectancy by about 15 years being a member of the House of Lords. So I'm at the age of 55 and I still have about half of a lifetime to go. But most people, most people cannot achieve power by being nominated in a democracy to a, an undemocratic assembly. So what we have to do instead is to find ways of ensuring that truth triumphs and not lies, that we have authenticity, not fabrication, and that we have the politics of rights and not prejudice. And the only way of achieving those goals are for people who believe in truth, who believe in authenticity and are authentic and who believe in rights both to speak up, not to compromise, not to trim, but also to lead. And in this country at the moment we have a massive deficit of leadership uh, in pursuit of truth, authenticity and rights. And nowhere do we see this more, because you knew I was going to get to this subject sooner or later, nowhere do we see this more than in the current controversy about Brexit. Brexit is a programme which is run by people who are peddling lies in, in, inauthentic in their politics and who are supreme champions of prejudice. And the ultimate, ultimate purveyor of all of those three um, a, uh, attributes is the person who I seem to spend more of my life with than almost anyone else in TV and radio studios at the moment, one Mr Nigel Farage, who is the single most effective populist we have in British politics in the last generation. Indeed, he may be the single most effective politician in this country since Margaret Thatcher, depending on what happens in the next six months. And he has to be defeated, and he has to be defeated by those of us who believe in the truth authenticity and rights taking him on and not and not and not pandering to him and it means constantly constantly and in a populist way seeking to uh, to pursue the truth and to make arguments based on truth and rights and authenticity and not lies. I mean, this business all the time of being able to have something for nothing, which is the ultimate populist lie in politics, it's the ultimate lie that everyone can be satisfied and that the other, those people who are seeking to take it away from you, could be defeated, is the ultimate lie at the heart of Brexit. The idea that we can have all of the benefits of trade, engagement with the wider world, and our current way of life, and none of the obligations, none of the international obligations, none of the obligations to pay, none of the obligations to share, none of the obligations to pool our sovereignty, is the ultimate lie. And it comes all the way down to straightforward lies. So in my debates with Nigel Farage, what's the latest debate that is, this whole thing has been reduced to? It's been reduced as in the uh, referendum debate three years ago to a number. Do you remember three years ago, the bus, 350 million? all available for the NHS a week, which was a straightforward lie. Uh, maybe there's one of our esteemed candidates is standing on, on returning £350 a, a, a term to all of the members of the Oxford Union. It would be an e equal lie if it was... Uh, uh, maybe it is being claimed, I don't know what is, because uh, it is being proposed, but the, uh, it would be an equal lie. Now, what is it that Nigel Farage then says we should do? Because we have our current membership of the European Union, which costs us, but it's a great deal and it produces wider benefits. We have Theresa May who said 39 billion is going to be her exit fee. And I keep asking Nigel Farage, Nigel, what would you pay? A straightforward question, pitting the lies against the truth. And in our last debate, he said he would pay nothing. He said, nothing is what we should pay the EU when we leave it. I said to him, Nigel, that can't be true. 
It can't be nothing that we pay the EU, because there is this little matter of your own pension, <laughs> because he's been a member of the European Parliament for 20 years. So I said, what we must do, I said, because you have, this is how you have to confront the populace. I said, Nigel, I said, you could, of course, donate your pension to the NHS, because we have this problem of the 350 million. He wasn't volunteering to this. So I said, what we have to do, and I took him through this as he interrupted me, is we have to work out, Nigel, how many years you intend to live. When we have calculated how many years you intend to live beyond the age of 65, we should then multiply that by £73,000, add another 15 years because you want to become a member of the House of Lords and that's <laughs> going to extend your life expectancy, and then we need to double it. He said, what do you mean double it? I said, well, because you keep telling us, Nigel, that this is a big bureaucratic institution, the EU, which is hugely inefficient, so it's going to be a big service charge for your pension on top of it. And we all, all know, Nigel, that we've got to pay your pension because we can't possibly have you being a burden on the state in your old age. And we now know, because of my previous debates with him about citizenship, that his kids who've now got German passports, because German passports are good enough for his kids, but not for the other millions of young Brits in their 20s, they're going to be in Germany when he's retired, so someone's got to look after him here. Now, the truth of the matter is, just in that one case, his argument disintegrates, he folded in the debate, and then you can get on to a wider argument about the truth. But there is nothing new in this, uh, Mr. President, uh, if I may conclude, because the greatest purveyors of truth in, in representative and democratic politics have always been those who have been authentic, have been on the side of rights, have been the purveyors of truth, but have been able to make it popular. And that two uh, uh, of the greatest proponents that comes to my mind, one is has the, by far the most splendid statue in this august chamber, the People's William, that's what he was called. Mr Gladstone, President of the Oxford Union in 1830, may be the greatest peacetime Prime Minister this country has ever produced, four times Prime Minister until his 80s. All of the great causes that he, 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 he um, pursued, uh, including the development of representative government as we know it now, right through until self-government for Ireland, which was his great last cause, which if it had passed, but it was defeated by... The, port, the, the Tory populist of the day would have, event, would have prevented a uh, hundred years of bloodshed in Ireland. He was the supreme purveyor of popular politics. He developed the soundbite decades before any other politicians did so. What were his slogans? You cannot fight the future, trust the people. Liberalism is trust in the people tempered by prudence. Toryism is distrust of the people tempered by fear. That is the politics we need to see today. But the supreme example of populist politics occurred to me when I was doing what I often do when I'm thinking about uh, speeches, which is my office is around the corner from Westminster Abbey, and I go and sit in the cloisters of Westminster Abbey and think what it is I'm going to say. One of the greatest historic and religious uh, uh, places in, in our country. And, you know, the ultimate populist slogans of the left came to my mind as I sat there and looked around. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Love your enemies. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Populism goes back to the very beginning of our communal life. There is good populism, there is bad populism, there is in this world good, there is evil. Let's be on the side of the good, let's make it popular, and let's not give in to those who seek to undermine it. Thank you very much. <laughs>